we will be conducting an oral history interview today for the DC Oral History Collaborative and Asbury United Methodist Church in the District of Columbia. Mr. Millette is the president and CEO of AfriCare, a non-governmental organization whose mission is to improve the quality of life of the people of Africa. Among other things, he is a man of faith, a husband and father, and an avid art collector. Today we're going to explore some of the paths that led Mr. Millette from his birthplace of Houston, Texas to the nation's capital. Mr. Millette, good morning and thank you for welcoming us into your home. Good morning, Pandit, and you're welcome here. Thank you. Um, can we just start then with Houston? Uh, you were fortunate enough to have a strong family upbringing. Can we talk about that family and some of the family values that were instilled with you that started you off on your journey? Sure. I mean, I, um, I grew up in Houston. I was born and raised there. And I, uh, we were uh, a family that was very close. We still are very close. We lived near one another. My grandmother lived two houses down. I had an aunt who lived two houses down. Uh, my grandfather on my father's side didn't live too far away from us. So we were, there are five of us. I have a brother and three sisters and both my parents were in our home. My father was a steel worker. Uh, my mother uh, was unemployed for uh, most of her life until we all went off to school. Uh, and then she actually became a, a, a hospital a housekeeping aide uh, at St. Joseph Hospital in, in Houston. So it was a, a, a big bunch, a fun bunch. Uh, we had our disagreements here and there, but uh, we all made it through. What were some of those messages that you still remember that came from your parents and your grandparents that sort of helped propel the choices that you then made as a young man? Working hard was always something that almost never had to be said. It was always watched. So that was always an important value. Uh, I don't know if I knew the word integrity growing up because they didn't use that word. Uh, but what I know about them and what I saw in them were very honest, hardworking people. Uh, for the most part, there was not gossip in my home. We did not uh, partake in that. Uh, they were honest. They were hardworking. Church people. Uh, my, my mother, grandmother, very much church people. My father, a little rebellious. Uh, though had been baptized, had accepted Christ at an early age, but uh, he was probably considered a backslider. And were they all originally from the Houston area? My father was a native Houstonian. My mother's uh, side of the family came from Polk County, Texas, which is about 80 and 90 miles up the road, uh, Livingston, Texas, uh, and the like. So you had jobs as a young uh, child and teenager before you went to uh, college? Oh, sure, sure. The, my first job was cutting yards in the neighborhood. My, my brother uh, and I would take our lawnmower on uh, Friday evenings and Saturdays, and we would cut neighbors' yards for $6 or $5. That was our lowest price. We didn't cut any yard less than $5. Uh, also, we there was a... At our church, at my mother's church, there was a minister named Samuel Gaston there who uh, used to take a group of teenage boys. He was a landscape architect. He did landscaping for fairly wealthy people. Uh, and he would, part of his crew, or with those of us who had very little experience, but he was teaching us uh, hard working values and how to do a yard properly. I did that for two summers as well. And what did that instill in you? How did that stick with you in later years? I know you've mentioned before that he was an influence on your life. Yeah, he was very much so. Had several of us. Well, one of the things he did is 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 comradeship. What what working together means and how much you can accomplish when you work together. Just cutting a yard, understanding either that it makes quick work when you work together. Uh, you also can set high standards when you work together. Uh, but also, he used to talk to us all the time about all kinds of things. Uh, anything from uh, how to treat girls, women, and, and uh, you know, just kind of, as they say, boy kind of things. You just kind of learn. Now, most all of us who worked with him uh, were from and around our church, so most of us had our families already. 
but it was just fun to be together. Tell me, you just mentioned that these were wealthy, um, wealthy houses, wealthy neighborhoods. What impression did that create in you that, that you carried with you as you went along? Well, it was certainly a different side of the track than I lived on. While I wouldn't say that, that my family was by any stretch of imagination poor or wanted for anything, uh, we certainly didn't have the level of finery uh, and large estates and homes that I saw. Uh, I suppose it, it also showed me a side of life that I had not had regular exposure to. Uh, to some extent, it probably gave me a material thing to aspire to, though I don't really recall that being an active part of thinking about it at the time. Uh, after you see a lot of big houses, but you also see a lot of big houses with people who weren't very nice to you. Uh, you were in the hot, you know, cutting their yard, they're sitting on the patio or on their back porch, drinking lemonade, drinking water, and they never offered it to you. Uh, we had to usually go to a local supermarket or a nearby drugstore somewhere to use the restroom uh, because you dare not uh, ask to use anyone's restroom. And I, I understand that. Uh, but it was just what you understood is that you were the help. And, uh, you know, but people who have means need people who help. Uh, and that also gave me a sense of the power of help that you would help others in the future? Sure. So as you made your decisions growing up, education seems to be something that was just basically understood. It was taken for granted that you were going to go to college? Well, I wouldn't say it was taken for granted. Uh, I, I would say that it was something that became very important to me. Both my parents were high school dropouts mm -hmm. uh, and always regretted their decision, did not go back to school to finish, uh, though two of the brightest, smartest people I think I've ever met in my life. Uh, and my father would always say, without an education, you'll never get past the steel mill. He worked for 31 years for a steel, steel mill. Uh, and while it was a good living for us, uh, he always said, you want to get past the steel mill. I remember my dad getting up every day at about five o'clock in the morning, every day without fail, uh, quietly going to work, uh, never complained about it. Uh, but it was, I would, I would not say from his point of view, it was anything he ever talked about uh, as a source of pride for him. I think having a job was a source of pride, but what he did was just functional. That's just what he did. He was a crane operator. And so how did you make your choices excuse me, <clears throat> about where you were going to go to school after high school? Well, you know, there's a lot of peer influence by this time. Uh, our generation was certainly a generation that was discussing college, and we, you know, also my parents had friends who, who had gone to college and I'd gone to high school with people. So we had some role models uh, available to us. Uh, I just, I wasn't certain where I was going to go. I was looking at Carleton College, uh, Yale uh, College. Uh, some people at our church had gone to Carleton, uh, Gustavus Adolphus in Minnesota, uh, Hampton, uh, University of Texas. There were a lot of things floating around my head. But one day, I got a catalog in the mail. And I remember it very well. And, and the, on the cover of it uh, was a quote from Howard Thurman. And it said that over the heads of her students, Morehouse holds a crown that she challenges them to grow tall enough to wear. Now, I thought that was something. And I opened the brochure, and that was a whole list of, uh, it was titled, A Morehouse Man Is. And it would go down the line. It would have a photograph of a Morehouse man and a description of what he was doing. I just thought that must be the baddest place in the world to go to school. And I made up my mind right then and there, I was going to go to Morehouse. Good decision. Excellent decision. Tell me about some more decisions along that early path of yours. What do you think, after going to Morehouse, what was one of the next best decisions that you took? Well, going to Morehouse and choosing the friends I did, uh, sort of developing my own uh, set of uh, friends and people with whom I would share the rest of my life. 
uh, I think I chose wisely uh, in terms of the the men that I, I became friendly with. And obviously some women at, at Spelman as well, I chose very wisely. Uh, so I feel good about that. That was a good thing. But the interesting thing is I almost didn't uh, really get to stay at Morehouse because when I went to Morehouse, I left Houston with, um, I left Houston with uh, $200 in my pocket a scholarship uh, from the Jones Scholarship in Houston, which was $1,000 a year, I think, uh, and one other small scholarship. And that's all. And my parents put me on the plane uh, with a, another friend of mine. We grew up together in Houston. We went to Morehouse together. And uh, I got there, and I had no way of paying the tuition, no way of paying for housing. So I got there, they had not assigned me a room, neither he nor I, now he had a scholarship. Uh, I had not qualified for any of those things because my, my folks were gainfully employed. And um, Monday morning of freshman week, at eight o'clock, I was sitting outside of the Office of Financial Aid. And I sat there almost all day waiting to see someone. And I finally got in to see a woman by the name of Jeanette Smith. Jeanette Smith is my personal angel. I went in to talk to her, and she had my file and records. She said, well, Mr. Mallet, I, I don't understand. You don't, you don't uh, how are you going to pay for school? You don't have any, any additional aid besides the scholarships. That will not pay your tuition. Uh, or your parents, and I see your parents, are they helping you go to school? I said, well, no, not really. Uh, they'll send me mon money every month, but no, they were not going to pay the tuition bill. And she closed the folder and she looked at me. She said, I just don't understand. I don't know how we can help you. And I thanked her for uh, talking to me and seeing me. And she said, well, what are you going to do? And I simply said to her, I'm going to find a way to go to school here. And I thanked her again and I walked out of her office. And that night, of course, I was worried about it. I think I probably prayed about it, talked to my roommate about it, said I was going to get up in the morning and go look for jobs. He said, you can't go look for jobs. you got freshman week because they allowed me to participate in uh, freshman orientation, assuming that my financial aid package may or may not work out. And if it didn't, I, that was all I was going to do. So I did that. But on Thursday, this is a long story, but it's an important story. On Thursday, the faculty and staff met the freshman students in a receiving line at the Frederick Douglass Commons. And I was going through the receiving line, and I met the director of financial aid. His name was Witty Gordon. And when he heard my name, he said, Robert Mallet, I've heard that name. And he, stood out, he stepped out of the line, pulled me aside, and he said, my... Uh, Deputy Director of Financial Aid, Jeanette Smith, was very impressed with you, said you were the politest young man she had seen all day. Why don't you come back to the office tomorrow and we'll see if we can work something out. I was at the office the next morning when it opened, before Mrs. Smith got there. Uh, when she got there, she took me in her office. She said, I think we've worked something out. They gave me a set of loans uh, and a work-study job in the financial aid office. And that is how I was able to pay for my first year of school. And after my first year, uh, I did well enough to qualify for some scholarships, continued to work while I was in, in college, and took some more loans that they were able to give me. And that's how I made it through Morehouse. And your major? I majored in political science and English. And did you go on to law school? I did. I, uh, while at Morehouse, I, I did reasonably well. I was a, a an overseas scholar, a Charles E. Merrill overseas scholar. I went to London School of Economics, uh, graduated from Morehouse, and went to Harvard Law School. And your parents, who were high school dropouts, as you told us, yes. what was their reaction to all this? Were they stunned and amazed? No, my parents just, you know, I, I've never really talked to them about it. They, it was unremarkable to them. They assumed I knew what I was doing. And I would get faithfully a check every month from my, my mother, uh, $50, $75, $100, or 
whatever it was I needed. I wrote home and uh, my grandmother was living. She'd send a little money. I mean, it was, I didn't, I don't feel particularly deprived of much. I ate well. I was able to buy the things I needed. I was very lucky. Were you able blessed. To be blessed. Were you a planner? Um, if you look at your life, how much would you attribute to fate and how much to your own careful planning of your path? I don't feel as if I have planned my life. I feel as if I have, I have prepared myself for circumstances and the next opportunity. I think is the best way to say it. There are some things I wanted to do. I wanted to go to law school. Uh, while in law school, I figured out that I wanted to clerk for a judge after I finished law school. Uh, those things, to that extent, I planned. Uh, and after the clerkship, I wanted to go to a law firm. So to that extent, maybe I did plan, but it doesn't feel like I planned, and certainly not after my first law job. Uh, I think things begin to fall in place and fall together. Uh, I wouldn't say it was a, a path created for me, uh, but opportunities presented themselves that appealed to me, uh, and I happened to be ready to take them, take advantage of them. You have a multi-sector background, which is unusual, but particularly in an African-American man. I want to talk about your perceptions of having come from the South, you Houston, and then Atlanta for school, and then the District of Columbia. Yes. Um, is that the path, or am I missing a stop? No, I'm, I'm, I, during college I studied in, in London. In London, yeah. which is a whole different thing. Yeah, a whole different thing. A whole other thing, as they say. A whole other thing. Um, first of all, did you consider the district to be the South? No, I did not. What was your impression when you first arrived here? Well, you know, I had an aunt who lived here, and she welcomed me with open arms. So I, I w came into a situation where uh, people who cared about me. Uh, you were how old? When I moved to Washington, I think I was 26 when I came here. And uh, it was, I had been to Washington a few times before. I uh, thought it was a great town, really great town. Uh, it was a town with a river which I thought was very exciting, having lived in Boston and had a river. I said, you know, you really want to live in a town that has a river. <laughs> uh, and I enjoyed that. And I, I decided not to, to stay at home or go back home uh, to start my career. Back home to Houston. Back home to Houston. Uh, they'll kind of never let you grow up in a way. Uh, and I came here to a law firm and thoroughly enjoyed the city, uh, taking advantage of of federal Washington, taking advantage of the neighborhoods of Washington. I enjoyed it very much. And so, talk about then the path that you found yourself on in this first law firm. First of all, what type of law were you practicing? It was health law. We were doing, our, my first client was um, Bristol Myers and Johnson & Johnson, the pharmaceutical industry. We were representing them, and that was the first client. I did some other kinds of work but basically, that's the work that we were doing. And what year are we? 1983, okay. when I came to Washington. Okay. So how would you describe the environment of Washington at that time, political, and, and, but in particularly, again, for an African-American man um, pursuing a professional career, Harvard grad, gone to London, great credentials. What was it like? I've never thought a lot about that. Um, I, I don't feel that it was unwelcoming. I certainly can't say that. Uh, the city being a majority black city at that time, uh, had a black mayor uh, at the time. I think Marion Barry was the mayor uh, in 1983. Uh, we were just beginning to experience some of the issues around, uh, you know, a Washington that, that needed more resources to be a successful city. Uh, I think the, the, the mayor was very popular at the time. Uh, what I do remember, uh, which is pretty fixed in my memory, is how difficult it was to get a taxi cab. Uh, I, I remember that. Uh, and I remember planning for how I would get home. Because when I first got here, I hadn't bought a car. 
because I didn't think I needed one. I lived close to the subway, so I could take the subway to work, back home. You were living with your aunt at that N time? For the first 30 days, I did. She lived up uh, on Connecticut Avenue and Van Ness East uh, condos. And, but I had an apartment in Southwest Washington on G Street, which was near the Federal Center Southwest Metro stop. So I had planned my life to take the subway. Uh, hadn't bought a car. Uh, was thinking about it, but just kind of figuring out whether I really needed one. Um, and of course, by then I had to start paying back those student loans from Morehouse and Harvard. So um, I lived where I could get around pretty easily, could get a taxi cab. But my first set of experiences being out late at night after turning 11 o'clock, coming from dinner or a club or whatever I had done, I just remember it being very difficult to get a taxi cab, having to get some white colleagues sometimes to flag me a taxi cab. Uh, and I learned to plan my evenings around that. There was no Uber, there was no Lyft. Uh, if the subway had stopped, uh, you either walked home, you, uh, I, didn't, I didn't know the bus routes at the time, or you got a taxi cab, or you got to ride with someone else. So your neighborhood at that time was predominantly African American, where you were living? I lived in Southwest, which, which had a, it was sort of mixed in Southwest. That was one of the urban uh, uh, center projects that they started. Although I lived on G Street in an apartment building and later on G Street in a townhouse, there were a set of, I think, the Greenleaf uh, projects uh, right nearby. Never any trouble or anything, and never had any a particular fear of walking in the neighborhood, uh, seeing people walk to the store to get my groceries with my cart. I never, I never felt fear about that. Now, it may have been because I grew up around people who lived in projects. I grew up around people who uh, lived in substandard housing. Uh, uh, my, my parents were landlords uh, to some of the people. I went to school with some of the people who lived in rental housing. Uh, I, my first time living in rental housing was when I uh, went off to college, uh, went off to law school. I'd never lived in rental housing. And the first house by myself, uh, the apartment I rented, that was the first time I'd ever rented an apartment on my own. So your parents, um, as you have described to us, they were working people. They didn't come to own these things through a major inheritance. Oh. They, they worked their way, so you had that as a, as a model, if you will, as a value. Hard work will get you material comforts, if sure. you will, um, and then you treat others well with what you got, and you sure. help others. Sure. Help others. Well, they were, they were, my father had a job. They owned some uh, rental properties. My grandfather owned a, a cafe or a little grocery store that was a motel for colored. Uh, uh, in Fifth Ward uh, in Texas, so he was always, he was, my grandfather, my father's father was quite an entrepreneur, he always worked for himself. My father, who was an only child, uh, always told us he was so glad to grow up so as not to have to work as hard as he had to work, and he wanted a job, <laughs> so. And did you see that same sort of entrepreneurial um, opportunity for black folks in the district when you moved here? See it? Some. It would depend on where I went in the city. Uh, I, I was learning the city. I did not know the city. So I was learning things. I would go up to get my hair cut up on Georgia Avenue, uh, and I would see a number of, of what I would consider to have been black-owned businesses there. So that was something I saw. At what point did you decide to move away from practicing law inside a law firm itself? Well, that's a pretty easy thing. In 1986, uh, I think the Democrats won the majority in the Senate. And I had a friend of mine, Ralph Everett, a Morehouse man, uh, who knew I was interested in working on the Hill. I'd come to a point at the law firm. I'd been there four years. It was a good time to, to move. And he called me to say, send your resume. There are a lot of places that they, you know, we need to increase the number of African-American staff. Send your resume which I did. He sent it around to several people. I got a call from the office of Lloyd Benson. He was, was my home state senator from, from Texas and went up, met with his staff there, 
Uh, needless to say, it went very well. I got the job offer and I ended up in January of 1987 uh, starting to work on the Hill. And doing? Uh, my title was legal counsel, but I was doing legislative counsel work for in the senator's personal staff. He was chairman of the Finance Committee and he was on the Senate for Commerce, Science and Transportation and I worked most of the issues for the Commerce Committee for him. Any one exciting story that you want to share from that time? Well, you know, he ran for vice president while I worked on his staff and I had an opportunity uh, to uh, participate in that campaign uh, at the convention, travel with him some on his plane. Uh, it was a rather enjoyable period of time there. One good story. There's got to be stuff to share. Well, I met one of my uh, closest friends when I worked on the staff, who's still a very close friend. And I met uh, my wife, my present wife, when I was on his staff, though she wasn't, you know, my, we weren't dating or anything. Years later, we ended up getting married, but uh, I, in fact, uh, met two of the most important people in my life while I worked for him. And for those of uh, our audience who may be younger, who was the other person on the ticket? Uh, that was uh, Michael Dukakis. It was uh, Dukakis Benson. And uh, we always thought the ticket should be flipped uh, uh, when, when that was happening. But uh, uh, Governor Dukakis had gone through the primary system and had legitimately won. And Benson was, to be, was proud to be on the ticket with him. And so when that campaign, unfortunately, unsuccessfully ended, what was your thought process then? Well, we were kind of bummed out after uh, the debate when uh, I think the, I, ca I can't remember the anchor, was it Bernard? Calp. No, that's no, Bernard Wolf, uh, black Shaw. anchorman, Bernard Shaw, Bernie Shaw, asked Governor Dukakis uh, if his wife had been raped, would he still be opposed to the death penalty? And it was really a question uh, that required an emotional response. And Governor Dukakis gave a cerebral response, uh, which we knew at that moment that that was that we had probably lost the campaign. It was that big of a moment, uh, and also the time that they saw him in the tank, and he looked like Mickey Mouse. Uh, and I remember we were thinking, "We're not. This is not going well." <laughs> Explain. Well, he had his staff decided to put him in a, a military tank. Uh, and he sat in the tank and they gave him a helmet and because he was a, a small diminutive man uh, it made him look like uh, Mickey Mouse. I mean he, he it didn't look it, it didn't it wasn't the shot that we really wanted for the campaign. Benson was doing his part uh, having uh, blown away Dan Quayle in the debate uh, but I think the the mood of the country had changed. Uh, the Bush campaign was uh, pretty hard-hitting in some of its advertisements and simply met their moment better than, than uh, Governor Dukakis did. And this is George H.W. This is George H.W. Bush. Okay. And so, what next? Well, after the campaign, just continued to work on the senator's staff, but of course we all were, were it, was, it was such a high moment for us, and I had reached a point where it was probably time to leave the Hill. Uh, there was not any opportunity to move up on Benson's staff for me. So I had a friend uh, who, the woman I was dating at the time, uh, who was a Washingtonian. Well, she's, she's from Oklahoma, but she's a Washingtonian even now. Um, uh, was working as a civil rights lawyer and had just moved uh, to, to D.C. from New York, but was still working for the Legal Defense Fund. But she had worked closely at a law firm with a, a man who Sharon Pratt uh, Dixon at the time had chosen to be the city's corporation counsel. Sharon had just won. We were all excited about her winning. And uh, his name was John Payton, the late John Payton, very fine lawyer, one of the finest I've ever known, uh, was trying to recruit my girlfriend at the time to become his deputy and she on the other hand was very clear with him that she was not interested in doing that job but that Robert was probably at a point where he would be considering a new job 
And I didn't know she had done that and had convinced John that he ought to talk to me. He did, and I accepted the job as deputy, principal deputy corporation counsel. Now they call them uh, attorney generals, deputy attorney general. And I did that job. I, I left the Hill, which had a rather unusual relationship with the District of Columbia. Uh, I didn't understand uh, fully uh, that relationship until I went to work for the city. And when I became the principal deputy corporation counsel, I began to understand the dynamics between uh, federal D.C. and local D.C. far better than I'd ever understood it before. In 2019 terms, you were called Racine? I was called Racine's deputy. All right. Yep. And so, um, obviously, without, without going into all the detail, but what was that relationship and how did it affect the district, the residents of the District of Columbia? Oh, it was almost a feudal relationship. Feudal. And it's F-E-U-D-A-L. Like Game of the Thrones. Yes, yes. In the sense that, that they were, you know, the, 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 the Lord Masters uh, and the district is politicians and leaders trying to move the city in a certain direction never had the final say. It was always Congress. Uh, now, some, to some extent, uh, you know, we had had home rule by then, so a lot of that had improved from what it used to be before home rule, but it was still a situation where uh, the city wanted to chart a certain direction, uh, and it was not entirely clear that it would always have the final word. Uh, when Sharon, uh, when Mayor Dixon uh, was elected, uh, it was a change of leadership, uh, a breath of fresh air from uh, the previous mayor who had had some problems and, and had, had really bad PR problem. Uh, and she was very different. Uh, I think they liked her a lot. Uh, they didn't know they uh, the, Congress. the Congress. They didn't know how tough she was going to turn out to be. Uh, and, and they gave her immediately a, 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 the, an increase in the federal payment, one of the first largest increases that the city had had in years. It was $600 million dollars moving from, from a moment like 350. So it was, a, it was a, a brief honeymoon, but it was a honeymoon all the same. And it was a good time that the city enjoyed. Uh, and although uh, Mayor uh, Kelly, Mayor Dixon, she, she married while she was in office. Uh, so I, and I, she's a friend of mine, so I still call her Cher, Sharon. Uh, although we were not successful at re-election, uh, she did set the city up for a lot of the issues uh, that were later finally addressed, and she was not unwilling to talk about uh, how futile the relationship was and why the relationship had to change because the district was born structurally in a deficit and it would never get out uh, without certain things changing. Uh, and she was very powerful about that. Uh, and she was probably mayor of the district at a time when the district had the least amount of resources. Uh, and she was trying to do uh, some new things and some different things. So the biggest accomplishment, if you were to think of that administration, is that you were able to recalibrate the relationship between uh, Congress and the district? I think it was recalibrated. I think she put on the, on the, on the agenda the issues about what the district's needs are. That its revenue base was too small, that that was forcing population shrinkage, that our workforce for the district was probably larger than what it should be for what the city could afford, that the federal payment had to increase and they had to remove, uh, which are traditionally state obligations, they either had to fund them more or remove them from the district. Uh, later, when the district had its um, control board, uh, all of those things came to pass. Now, was Mayor Williams the next mayor? Uh, no, Mayor Barry became the mayor, mayor again. Mayor Barry became the mayor yeah. again. Mm -hmm. Correct. Correct. I'm telling you, you were there. Yes. Um, so gentrification had not yet raised no, its head not yet. during that time. Um, and so my question for you, having been here since 1986 yes. in the district. And I lived in the district in 19, moved here in 1983. In 1983. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about the change that you have seen. I mean, you were inside of an administration who was trying to deal with getting out of one set of circumstances. What do you see when you look now 
at, at the set of circumstances in which the district finds itself today? Well, we knew it was going to change because we knew it had to change. Uh, we just did not know it had to change in the way that it did uh, and that the change would be quite as fast as it turned out to be. Uh, there has been profound gentrification in the district. Uh, I used to get my hair cut up on Georgia Avenue. I go up there now, I see Pandemonia, and I see uh, it's, a, it's a different population walking the street. Uh, that is not to say that all gentrification is bad. I don't mean to suggest that. Uh, but the city did change uh, in a serious way. Now, it started to change after the services improved, after it's, it started getting a higher tax base. Uh, I think uh, Mayor Williams uh, thought that the city needed to grow by at least 100,000 residents because we had been losing middle-class black residents in droves. Uh, I think we probably expected some of those middle-class blacks would return. They did not return. Uh, what they were replaced by were a number of young, uh, I guess we call them millennial uh, whites now, uh, moving into the center city of the city. Uh, and it's almost unaffordable. So it's a plan that sort of had some unintended consequences, perhaps? Well, I think the plan was to increase the tax base and to make it more substantial. That was a worthy plan. There was no... There was nothing to be critical about that. The city needed that. Uh, what I think people didn't fully factor in uh, was that you wouldn't get an influx of middle class blacks coming back to the city. They'd made their homes elsewhere. Uh, but we got a lot of single uh, millennials. Now you got, with that, you got Latinos, you got uh, African Americans, you, the city is very diverse. You got uh, mostly young white millennials. It's a very diverse and different city now, and 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 very dynamic, uh, and and I I don't I, I'm I'm not the one to suggest that anything has been uh, uh, bad about strengthening your tax base to allow you to offer more services to people in need, improve the quality of your services. You are concerned about people who are displaced, that they have nowhere to go. Uh, and people who are service employees who, who, who cannot afford housing. That is a very major issue and is something that, that, that I think the city leaders uh, perhaps should have paid more attention to. And the effect on the flavor and the feel yes. of the town. So um, following the, your career change from the Hill to the city, city. administration. Yes, when, when Sharon lost the mayorship, uh, I was not likely to stay a second term. Uh, that I uh, know that well. Well, it just it was the. I, what I didn't say was, eight months as principal deputy corporation counsel, I got a promotion to city administrator because the city administrator moved, uh, left the administration, and Sharon went searching for a new one, and selected me. Uh, I to this day have no idea how or why she made that decision. Maybe I, I know what she said, but uh, it, was the, it was the one job I can say that I've had that was hard. It was hard not because it required more smarts, though it did require smarts. It was hard because you were always working. There was never a point at which, as a city administrator, or as the mayor, where you weren't on where people can call you in the middle of the night and you've got to move, you've got to do something. Uh, and then everybody knew you. So everywhere you went, you go to a party, they had, they had a problem that, you know, I took, a, I took to taking a little notepad uh, to come back on Monday to try to respond to, to some of the people that I met. Uh, it was also a job I had to stretch. I had, I, I had to learn and stretch in doing it. It was the hardest job I've ever had, but the best job that I ever had in the sense that I learned a lot. I learned how to help people. I learned things that didn't work uh, and how you had to change to make some things work. And I just got exposed to so many things. Any one um, person or memory stick out in your mind from that time? Something that you were able to affect? I have several memories of, of that time. Uh, people don't talk about failures very much, but this is 
something I talk about from, from that era. We, we did a lot of good, important things and changed, made a lot of positive changes uh, in the city. Uh, and we have a record uh, to prove it. They don't talk about it as much, but, it, but it's there. But I remember one of our failures and something that I really learned from it. Uh, at the time, uh, we were alarmed at the number of low birth weight babies uh, that were being born in the District of Columbia, and that was the time of the crack epidemic as well. Vincent Gray, who later became mayor, was head of the uh, Department of Human Services, very committed to children, as was the mayor. And we really wanted to do something about low birth weight babies. One, we wanted to get as many uh, of the residents who qualified for Medicaid signed up for Medicaid so they get better health care. Uh, and we wanted some of the younger girls who were becoming pregnant to get uh, prenatal care uh, before we wanted to see a doctor at least four times before they gave birth. That was the standard. And we, we had a relationship, a partnership with Georgetown, and we had Georgetown had uh, a bus that we were going to go around and and make certain that, that we signed up all of these people for Medicaid and we got these young women who were expecting uh, to see a physician or a nurse aide. And we went all around to some of the poorest sections of the city with that bus and knocking on doors trying to get people to sign up. And not that many did. Why? And well, because they didn't really know who we were. And they didn't trust us. So lesson learned. It was a lesson learned that if, you, if you're going to, to try to get people to do real behavioral change, which is what that required, uh, you really needed to get them to tell you how that should be done. We should have been doing some conversations with people in the beauty shop and in the clubs and talking about the problem and what would make people, what, what, would, what would it take to make you want to, to go get some uh, prenatal care. It was a real learning experience for all of us. I think it, it, we called it a failure because our goals for that particular activity had not been met. But we were successful later in learning how to do that. And it was one of the, I, I've carried that story with me a long time and I've told it many times over because it, people who think they know something about communities really don't know what they think they know. And people in communities know far more about what moves communities uh, than what the experts know. And that was an important thing. And I should have known that growing up where I grew up and understanding what I, what I understood. Uh, I, I, I talk about my father a lot and, 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 and my mother as well, but uh, my father was probably considered in a way a slum landlord because he had some of these you know, rental houses and he would go collect his rent uh, in cash every week and my brother and I would go with him. I went off to college, I studied sociology, a number of other things and realized my father was a slum landlord and we went back home and we used to talk to dad, hey, how could you do this? I mean, why do you go collecting rent every week? No one does that. And all my father said to us, and I'll never forget it, he said, well son, that may be, I may be just what you said. He said, but I'm the person helping these people keep a home. The people who are helping to support you in school, he said it just like this, are people who cannot afford to save their money until the first of the month. You have to get the money from them when they have it so they can keep their house. I don't have turnovers in tenants because they pay their rent when they have the money. They can't wait and save up money. There are too many things that interfere with their lives. Kid gets sick. They have an emergency, somebody dies, they got to help. I never understood that. Sociology never taught me that. I should have known this when we did that work in the district. At this time, had you yet found your way to Asbury United Methodist Church? Yes, I, I <laughs> oh, Asbury United Methodist Church. I, when I first came to the district, I was church shopping. I was going to different places and you know, I was a, a person of faith and I had gone to church when I was in college and, and law school. I, my, my grandmother and my, my, my uh, they, that, that just wouldn't have gone over well if I told them I, I did not find a church. Um, 
and I'd visited lots of churches and I had a friend who was a preacher in, in Baltimore and I was driving to Baltimore sometimes to go to Union Baptist Church uh, where, where he was and, and where his home church. He suggested to me one day, he said, Robert, you've been going to churches for like two years. Have you been to Asbury? I said, no, not yet. He says, downtown at 11th and K, you ought to go over there. You ought to go hear this preacher, Frank Williams. He's almost a retired. You need to go over there. And I went over there one Sunday and he was preaching and it was, one, it was the kind of service I really enjoyed. It was, you know, it, it, there was an order to it. Uh, there was uh, good music uh, and it was a, a variety of music. There was a versatility uh, in music. Uh, and the preaching was pretty good. I thought Frank Williams was, had done a great job. I said, I gotta come back here. <laughs> and I did. I came back and I sat next to, the second time I came, I sat next to this lady named Lula Jackson. And I didn't, I, I, was, I was gonna write a check to put in the offering and I hit one in my pocket, I didn't have a pen. And I was sitting next to her, and we hadn't said very much to each other. And she said, do you need a pen? I said, yes. And she handed me a pen. And the pen was a, a, a Morris Brown college pen. Well, I had gone to Morehouse, and Morris Brown was in the Atlanta University Center. And I said, oh, you went to Morris Brown? She said, no, it was a Morehouse pen. I take that back. I said, your husband went to Morehouse. She said, no, but, but I went to Morris Brown. And we hit up this conversation, uh, and we just began to enjoy each other's company, and I, I started regularly coming to Asbury. But I did not join the church, that is to say, you know, now people don't join church, they sort of go and see, but at the time, you, 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 jo you offer your hand in fellowship. Uh, I joined after Reverend Williams had left, and we got a new minister by the name of Josh Hutchins. I continued to attend. Uh, without becoming a member. But I was pretty regular and I donated pretty regularly, but I never joined. At the time, you may remember in the, in the mid 80s, the anti-apartheid movement started in the district where we were, where Africare, TransAfrica and other organizations, the Lawyers Committee, the Civil Rights, were trying to, to press our administration to enact anti-apartheid legislation and the marches on the South African embassy started. Uh, and as a result, uh, I became a lawyer for the day. People would get arrested. And lo and behold, the day I was lawyer for the day, the pastor of Asbury and the associate minister got arrested that day. And I thought, if they're down here doing this, this is where I need to be a member. And about three Sundays later, I joined that church. So you're enjoying your career, your, your career, your time at Asbury. What roles have you played in the church? Well, let's see. Uh, for a long time, I was a bench warmer, always supported the church, but I did not get myself involved in very much. Uh, that changed under Reverend Hutchins, uh, who thought that I could do more. Uh, and then after Reverend Hutchins uh, passed away, Reverend Matthews as well. So I. I got asked to serve on the Board of Trustees um, as Herman Thompson's uh, vice chair. Uh, I was, and I subsequently became chair of the Board of Trustees uh, when Herman phased off under Reverend Matthews. I joined, I, I became an usher. That was the first thing I did because I knew how to do that. Uh, I had been an usher, a junior usher at my church, home church in Houston. And I thought that was probably enough to be an usher. Then Herman and Reverend Matthews talked me into the Board of Trustees. Then I became head of the Board of Trustees, uh, which then I got involved at the time with what they used to call the Administrative Board, which is now the Church Council. Uh, years later, see, I left. I, I, I stepped down as trustee board chair uh, because I, I left uh, Washington and moved to New York. Um, but, you know... As a career move? At, that was as a career move. Um, I certainly enjoyed the work I did uh, when I served 
on the Board of Trustees. The most important thing to be in your life is needful and helpful uh, and go where people need your help. And while Asbury has a very uh, uh, strong volunteer program, uh, I wanted to be a part of that because I could see how I could be helpful. What was the environment of the church at the time you were serving? What were the challenges that you were primarily dealing with? Well, at that time, we had this big issue about the church's air rights and things were being built around us and issues about whether or not we should acquire uh, some of the properties that were around us. Uh, I was very much in favor of doing that. We did not ultimately do it. Uh, that was a, a big issue at the time. Uh, one of the issues we're facing now is, is the impact that gentrification has had on Asbury. We were, were not really talking a lot about that uh, at the time. Uh, we were, I think, uh, the attendance was heavier then than, than what it is now. I think the Sunday school was more vibrant. I think Asbury goes, has gone through a number of seasons uh, and, and it was going through a season then, though we probably didn't fully realize it. With the benefit of hindsight, should the church have acquired the properties? Well, there's no question in my mind about that. We should have acquired properties both next door to us and behind us so that we could uh, build stronger social outreach programs. Not property just to have property sake or to stop people from development, but to be able to serve the population that, that we continue to try to serve today. It would be a lot easier to do that uh, now had we acquired some of those properties. But hindsight is twenty twenty. doesn't mean that, that we can't find, uh, continue to find ways to serve. And, and I think there's a lot of innovation in the church and a lot of resilience, and that is happening. Uh, with a number of the uh, ministries and, and outreach programs we have. And the biggest challenges for today? I think the big challenge for today uh, is the issue of, of the impact of gentrification on the church itself, where a number of people have moved out of the city who used to, to uh, worship at Asbury. They are now in the suburbs. They don't drive back into the city. That's a big issue. Trying to get uh, a more diverse uh, worship congregation, that's a challenge to the city. Uh, I, I, I have a very good friend who's at Asbury who said to me, she said, you know, I know we're trying to do this work, but do we ever think that really maybe white people really don't like to go to church with black people? Black people are actually far more willing to go to church where there are white ministers, but I'm not sure that the reverse is true. That's an issue that we're struggling with uh, because we're really trying to, to attract uh, who lives around us because those are more likely people, if they're churched, who are going to come to church. So that's a big issue. We're dealing with strengthening outreach ministries. The city has a lot of needs, uh, kids that are not reading at the levels that they should be reading. We have an elementary school nearby. We should be far more engaged with that school and we're now doing that. Uh, we have a significant housing problem in DC, homeless issues, uh, hungry issues. People are hungry in DC. We have a, a ministry around uh, feeding of the homeless, but also uh, providing food uh, to people during the week uh, who are not as well fed and well nourished as they ought to be. Those are very big issues and things that, that we must continue to emphasize as a living congregation of Christ. The church does indeed, and the city does indeed, have many challenges, some of which you've just described. Now, we're sitting here as we started out by saying, and let me also apologize for, for mispronouncing your name. I called you Mallet, <laughs> and it's Mallet. Sure. Yes? Yes. Mallet. All right. Yes. So we, there's one thing we can agree on. We are in a most wonderful home here in McLean. We're going to talk about the artwork that we mentioned earlier uh, in a bit. but. What um, keeps you still commuting to Asbury Church at 11th and K every Sunday morning? Well, I, I, first of all, I lived in the district for years, and then I moved to New York. And I lived in New York for almost 10 years, and I moved back into the district, had a home there. 
uh, had uh, uh, gotten remarried. I had, had, had been previously married, got remarried. We lived in the district for five years. What neighborhood? Uh, we lived in Forest Hills, a uh, perfectly lovely area of the city, uh, right near the park and perfectly fine home. Uh, but we decided to, to move when my son, my wife's son, uh, began to have some challenges in school, uh, bullying and the like, uh, and uh, decided uh, that, that, that we would move. Uh, the, the issue was whether you went to a private school or we moved, and I decided I didn't have enough money for private school. I had never gone to private school until I went to college, uh, so we decided to move, and we ended up quite fortuitously uh, in the old dominion, and I never thought in, you could have never convinced me that I would ever be a Virginian, uh, but, I, but here I am living in McLean. And still getting up and driving to Asbury. Still getting up driving to Asbury. Asbury gets into your bloodstream. Uh, it's a, a church that I think has a wonderful history. It has wonderful people. Uh, I think very committed Christians to try to do the right thing where they are. Uh, and I want to be a part of that. I want to be a part of, of revitalizing that, that congregation because I think it has a lot to offer, continue to offer the city. It w was uh, one of the oldest congregations in the city, uh, white or black. Uh, it's been on that corner uh, for 182, 83 years. Uh, and I think that's an important part of our history, and I want to be a part of it. And it's no problem for me to get up uh, and drive on Sunday morning uh, back to Asbury. First of all, it doesn't take me but about 15 minutes to go from here on the Sunday morning uh, to Asbury, which was longer than it took me when I lived on Linian. Now, I lived in the district in Southwest. That was quick and close. I had a house in Shepherd Park on Myrtle Street. That took me a little longer. Uh, and when I lived on Linian in Forest Hills, that took longer. So it's quicker for me to get the Hesperry from here. I understand. So um, career-wise, we've had you we're back in D.C., you're strong with the church. Um, what did you do after uh, you came back from New York? When I came back, well, I, when I, I worked for Pfizer uh, for nine and a half years when I was in, living in New York um, as a uh, senior officer of the company, uh, great company, uh, great job. I came back to D.C. and I started working for United Healthcare. Uh, that's that's the job I took. They're based in Minnesota, actually, but my boss, the the guy who who led my group, I was a general counsel to his group. Uh, he lived here. In fact, he lived in McLean. Uh, and I asked him, well, was he based in Minnesota or based in D.C.? He said, well, I'm going to stay here in D.C., so I thought you ought to be where your boss is. And that's why I, I ended up in D.C. All right. And then how long did you stay with United Healthcare when you returned here? Only two years. I left uh, because they consolidated the division I worked at, uh, the Public and Senior Markets Group, which dealt with the, the public health programs like Medicaid, uh, TRICARE, uh, the military care, and also uh, the AARP United Healthcare uh, partnership around supplemental co coverage for Medicare. That's the group that, that I was a part of. They consolidated that group with the commercial group, which was based in Minnesota. Well, that was sort of a, that was not an option for me. Minnesota was not going to it was you. It was not going to, that was not an option for me. Is healthcare still a personal passion of yours? I think it's critically important, and I think we have a broken healthcare system in the United States. It's better than what it was, not as good as it can be. So I still care a lot about it. The work I do now at AfriCare, uh, the platform of healthcare is a major platform for our work on the continent of Africa. So healthcare means a lot to me. Let's go back then to Africare. Mm -hmm. um, so again, I started by saying you have been a multi-sector man, yes. a renaissance man in every yeah. sense of the word. What led you to this particular job? Well, I, when I left United Healthcare, I had to find another job. I had to, had to, to get another line of work, as they say. Uh, and that took me longer than I expected. Now, 
knock on year, wood. Sorry, what year are we? Let's see. I left United Healthcare in 2011. After the crash. Yes, in in 2011. Uh, yes, I left Pfizer in '09, and I left. That was after the crash. I left Pfizer in '09, United Healthcare in 2011, and I expected to be employed right away. Uh, fortunately, and I I have multiple blessings that did not cause a crisis in my life when I did not get a job immediately. Uh, and it gave me some time, one, I traveled a little bit. It gave me some time also to reflect on you know, what next for me. I had been in every branch of government. I'd worked in the judiciary, judicial branch of government, federal government. I'd worked in the legislative part of the federal government. And we didn't talk about this, uh, after uh, I worked for Sharon, I worked for Bill Clinton and his administration as the Deputy Secretary of Commerce. So I'd done every branch of government, federal government, and I had done local government, pretty high ranking in local government as the city administrator. So, and I worked in the private sector at a law firm. I'd worked at a big, large corporation, the largest corporations in their sector. Pfizer was the largest drug company. United Healthcare, the largest insurance company. What else do you do? Sort of what's your, what's your second, third, or fourth act? Where I had never worked, though I had served as a board member, was in the nonprofit sector. I thought I really wanted to work at a university as a, a chief operating officer or chief administrative officer at a university. It was one of, my, one of the things I thought about doing. And I also thought about working for a nonprofit. What got me first was a nonprofit. And that's why I ended up at Africare. And had you a special interest in the continent? Always had, had a special interest in Africa. Uh, when I worked for Pfizer, a part of my portfolio was a number of, of programs and, me and access, medicine access programs uh, for uh, uh, emerging and low-income economies. So we've talked about um, art, and we've talked about your love of art, and when we think about some, I mean, I can't help, I'm looking at some of the, the, the artwork that you've accumulated, um, a fortunate- Did we talk about art? Mm -mm. Oh. We just started out by saying that you were an avid art collector. Oh, and okay, we uh, okay. And so I'm looking at this connection between some of the art that I see and your position at Africare, um, and wondering how those paths crossed, merged, and, and are happily situated. Well, most of the art acquisition was before I joined Africare. I probably have acquired less since I've been at Africare because I can afford less. Uh, when did your no. love of art develop? How did that start in you? I bought my first original piece of art when I was 19 years old, and I bought it from my West African history professor by the name of Carrie Wynn. And it was a scriptural piece from the book of Mark. And it says, I press on towards the mark. I was in college and I bought it in 1977, I think. Um, and you know, it's pretty battered now, but I've had it framed and I've never gotten it restored because I kind of want to remember it as when I, I first bought it, I was attracted to it, really liked it. Uh, but I didn't take care of it right away because I was moving, I was in college, I was in law school, but I kept it. Uh, and that was my first piece of original art. And I said, you know, I kind of like that. And I bought another piece when I first moved to Washington from the Evans Tibbs collection, Thurlow, the late Thurlow Tibbs. And, um, you know, for a while I collected posters I liked. And then I said, no, no, I, I got to get to the real thing. And I just, when I travel, I, you know, some people go shopping. I go shopping, but I go art shopping. Were you studying? How did you familiarize yourself with artists and, and the work that you enjoyed most? Talking to artists, uh, getting catalogs, art books, uh, looking at auctions that auction fine art. Uh, my collection is, is, is a little, I'd say a little bigger than modest, um, and it's probably 
mostly African American, but by no means all African American. A uh, number of uh, Hispanic artists uh, or Latin artists in, in it. Uh, and my wife was an art collector and her family collected uh, German Impressionist art, Expressionist art. So I have that uh, now part of the collection as well. So it's, it, you know, art uh, speaks across cultures. It speaks all languages, uh, love, beauty, color, passion, uh, easy to fall in love with art. And I fell hard. When you moved here, what was the art scene like in the district? You know, it's, it's funny. I, I, when I moved here, I knew a couple of, I'd gotten to know a couple of artists. I, Louis Melu Jones was an artist I, I had met uh, on the vineyard uh, with my aunt Frank and Uncle May had a little place on the vineyard and I met her there. So I, she was, I mean, and Louis Melu Jones you know, was an incredibly fine artist and she would tell me places to go. Uh, I could never afford some of those things. Then I met Thurlow Tibbs at the Evans Tips collection and talked to him about art. And I was on the art committee at Kay Scholler at the law firm I worked. And I convinced them that they should buy African American art from Thurlow Tibbs. And he furnished that firm with a lot of the art they had. Uh, and I was very proud of that. That was a, one of my big accomplishments to get the firm. They were looking for art for the walls. And they bought, I think, all African American artists. Now, they didn't know they bought all African American artists, but they did. <laughs> and are you are you an artist yourself? Do you like to dabble? No, can't draw a stick man. Can't can't draw a wink. Uh, but I I admire it. Uh, I love to to work with emerging artists, young artists. Uh, now I'm uh, my collection has become more focused as I've grown a little older, I met a lot more young African-American artists. I want to patronize them. Uh, they're doing some vanguard work, uh, wonderful work now. So I, I've gotten a, a lot narrower uh, in my collection strategy, but still not exclusive, but very focused on uh, emerging artists in the African-American community, men and women. When your child was in school, what were the art programs like? Did, did you think that there was enough emphasis on the arts in the public schools? When I was a kid? When, you're, when your child was a kid. Oh, no, no. Never thought it was enough. Really? No, no, no. Should be uh, much more prominent than what it is now. We're much more, because we're so focused now on STEM education. Uh, that's STEM education. Uh, liberal arts is, is not as valued uh, as a, a pathway for people anymore. Uh, I think that's a mistake. Uh, I think we need to broadly educate people. Now for me, for, for my sons uh, who grew up in the homes we've had, uh, they've grown up around art. So I think they take it for granted. Uh, you know, so what, what do you say? Well, it is a groundbreaker. I mean, as you travel around the world, do you find that? Do you find that art opens doors and creates pathways of communication? Oh, very much so. Very much so. Uh, you know, peop it doesn't take people long who are art people to figure out who the art people are. <laughs> you go into a gallery and you're looking around and, you know, my eye has gotten a little uh, more sophisticated, uh, shall we say. I've evolved a little bit. Uh, as I've grown up, uh, uh, up in, in art, that you can pretty much de detect and identify uh, the finer things. Uh, at least I think I can. Is it I'm not an art snob. Now, let, let me just say, I, I, I know it may sound like it, but I, I, think, I, I think art does not have to be expensive, uh, although we have to support artists. They have to make a living. Uh, I think uh, uh, all kinds of art is beautiful. I like figurative art, still life, uh, abstract. Uh, I, I think 
broad, a broad way of looking at, at how people see the world and share it with us is a wonderful thing. It helps you grow. The digital media as well, have you begun to explore that? Not as much of that. I mean, I, I, I you know, there are people who now do a lot of the gicle painting. I'm not taken to that so well. Uh, but maybe that's just because I'm a Luddite and I've not quite, uh, I don't quite understand that as well yet. Yet, but there's time. Sure. There's time to go. Yes. So going back to Africare, so they got you, they got you first. What was it like when you when you walked into that organization after having been all the places that you had been? What did you feel you were uniquely qualified to bring to that position that would help? Well, I I like to describe my my philosophy about working is that I'm a I, I'm a I think I'm a problem solver. Uh, I'm not afraid of problems. I want to understand them. I want to understand the people who are working in an organization. Uh, I think I'm a good a judge of people, a good people manager. Uh, you don't go somewhere, you fire everybody, or you know, you just kind of get to know the place, understand the culture. Uh, and Africa was a very different culture than some of the places I had been uh, working. One, it, it, it didn't have the level of resources. It was a resource poor organization, much like the district was when I was at the district. But this was a nonprofit, so it had even more uh, severe uh, issues. Uh, I learned a lot about uh, its circumstances, and it needed a, a lot of help, a lot of change. And the, the area where it works, the space it works in Africa, uh, was changing radically and, and very dynamically. And the organization uh, had not really changed with it and, and needed to. So there are a lot of things we had to do differently there. And so I was struck by the mission of your organization. How simple and pure and beautiful is that to improve the quality of lives? Improve the quality of lives of people in Africa. That is its sole mission. And we do that through a variety of ways. We do it uh, in our work in agriculture, food security and nutrition. We do it through health. Maybe it's maternal child health malaria, HIV. Uh, we also do work in what we call youth and women's empowerment. Uh, if the largest growing population in the world are African youth, uh, and by 2030 uh, there may be a billion people in Africa under the age of 35. So we've got to work very hard to make certain that a generation of Africans are learning, they are living productive lives by working, whether they're still on the farm. And of course, as I tell people all the time, in Africa, agriculture is huge. And you are 13 times more likely to grow out of poverty by remaining in agriculture in Africa than you are going into business. Now, of course, young people, you know, they've been on the farm all their life. That's not what they want to do. So they're, they're really rushing to the cities, creating all of these mega cities, huge cities, a lot of peri-urban areas, uh, lots of diverse tribes and, and, and people coming together, speaking different languages. It's a very interesting, dynamic place now. Do you have partnerships between young people, for, for example, in the District of Columbia and a particular city in Africa? Are you able to affect that sort of exchange, either physically or online? Or well, Africare doesn't do that per se, but there are certainly sister city arrangements. Uh, the DC uh, has a number of people who work in the sister cities program, and we know a lot of those, those places. Uh, we, we, we have a program in youth empowerment in Angola and in Nigeria that uh, kids are kids, uh, young people, uh, are engaged in exercise, learning more about uh, just how to study, learning how to come of age, learning about hygiene, learning how to live uh, away from uh, their family's farm, how to come together to live with other people. It's a, it's a very dynamic program. 
In our news here, there is talk about people protesting again because of the cost of AIDS medication. Obviously, we know in Africa there has been such a, a, an amazing epidemic, and terrible thing. Yes. What What uh, are you aware of in terms of progress that's being made? Is medicine available uh, to the people? Are you seeing a decline? I, I think we've seen a sea change in how uh, the availability of antiretroviral drugs on the continent because we've seen a sea change in the way they are funded. Uh, the donor agencies like the World Bank, uh, lots more investment, more availability of generic drugs, faster to get to market. Uh, you know, and we're still dealing with some of the first strains of, of HIV in Africa. We're now in our third or fourth generation of AIDS drugs here in the U.S., but we're still discovering and, and still trying to get people to get treated. Uh, but the president's uh, PEPFAR program that was started by George Bush, huge gift uh, in the sense of the gift of life to people because they could they have access to drugs. That's been a very big issue. When I, I first became engaged at Pfizer uh, in access to medicines issues, uh, we started a, a major program in Uganda uh, called um, the Infectious Diseases Institute in the sense that we thought that we needed more Africans studying infectious diseases in situ. Uh, and we thought we could have better collaboration between North American, European uh, uh, scientists, uh, medical professionals going to and fro. And we wanted to create a cadre of Africans who were studying infectious disease as it was occurring in their communities. And we started this thing called the IDI, the Infectious Diseases Institute in Kampala, Uganda. It has grown beyond my wildest expectations, employing more than a thousand people today. But when we first went there, we wanted to, to, to teach uh, and, and the like, but we also knew we had to treat and we were afraid to treat because we didn't know how we would be able to afford that. And I remember first going into the clinic at the IDI uh, with a friend of mine, uh, Warner Green. He's a medical professional out in California. It was very sad that Monday. But we went the next day on Tuesday. People were playing checkers. They were laughing. They were playing dominoes. And we didn't understand what was the change. And we asked the director. And he said, oh, on Tuesdays, we administer the drugs. On Mondays, people are just checking in, discovering whether they're, they have the disease. And Warner wrote this article that was a very impressionable article to me. Our job is to turn Mondays into Tuesdays. So within the AfriCare community, what goals do you have for um, assessing a successful tenure for yourself there as president and CEO? Well, uh, when I joined AfriCare, it was having some particular kinds of challenges. We continue to have some of them. But the most important thing for me to do uh, was to start setting a right a number of the things that were not quite clear. More transparency, more compliance, uh, improved compliance. Uh, those were very important things to regenerate its, its uh, development fundraising uh, platforms uh, to make certain that there was more accountability uh, at work there uh, and also to transition the organization uh, to be a lot not more nimble. Uh, does the organization continue in the form it is now? Or do we do something different? Do we find uh, more partners to work with? Those were, those were and are very important goals for the organization. You've mentioned before how teamwork uh, and, and communication and getting input and feedback from clients was the big lesson, one of the lessons you learned when working for the district. Have you been able to apply that lesson in the types of things that you're doing now? Well, the one thing I can say that I did not bring to AfriCare, that AfriCare is, 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 is inculcated all over, is in community-based uh, work that we listen to the communities we work in locally in Africa. We hire people who are African from those communities. 
Uh, that was not an innovation I brought to Africa. So we don't have any trouble with that. That's a very important component of what it means to be Africare. What connections do you feel, if any, between true connections between African Americans and Africans? Is there a real um, and, and viable connection that, that you feel in the district? You know, I can answer that question in a variety of ways. Uh, one, I think there are vibrant uh, uh, communities uh, of Africans in this region. Nigerians, Ghanaians, Liberians, Sierra Leone, uh, uh, just many different uh, Ugandans uh, who live in the region and who are making a good life, a fine life here, and also contributing back home. Uh, I don't think the communities work together all that much, but I think there's an effort on the part of the African Union here to bring them together, to bring together the Ethiopians uh, and others, uh, the Rwandans who, who are all here. So I think there's a vibrant uh, African community, and Ethiopia should have been the first one I said, because there's a large Ethiopian community here. Uh, I, I love all of the communities I meet and people. I have gone to uh, church with some Nigerian friends uh, just because to experience that a different kind of service than what I might get at Asbury. Uh, I don't think that's the important question though. I think what ought to be happening is all of us should focus ourselves much more sharply on the things we can do to continue to improve the continent, to improve the education of kids there, to improve the health care uh, that's delivered there, to improve the quality of the agriculture that is taking place there, to improve the nutrition that people get there. I think all of us could be a lot more focused on, on those kinds of issues. Because it has impact on us here in what way? Well, because it, 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 I think societies, as, as we all mature in this modern economy, I think Africa has to catch up and it has to run faster. It has to do more. Now, it has many gifts in that regard. One, it has extremely smart and innovative people. Two, a lot of the built up infrastructure that we have here, they, they can just leapfrog that technology. Uh, they don't have to build, uh, you know, put in, you know, miles and miles of fiber optic cable and all of that. Just leapfrog it. Now, that's a very important thing. And helping people have a chance by making certain that they go to school, that girls can stay in, girls can go to school, stay in school, that they don't have to drop out of school when they get their menses. Uh, vitally important, and that's the kind of work that we're focused on in Africare, and that is the kind of work that is going to ensure that Africa continues to grow and becomes a, 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 a world model uh, in, in economies in, in some of the countries. We've got a long way to go. We've got a lot of uh, uh, African leadership that needs to change, uh, that stay too long. Uh, we've seen it all, uh, but it's changing, and it's changing rapidly. And change. I would be remiss if we didn't sort of finish our time talking about, again, Asbury. Um, we mentioned some of the roles that you've had within Asbury. Anything that we left out in that conversation? Well, you know, I, you know, I, I, I did mention that I, I, uh, when I returned from New York to Asbury, I, I, was, a, I was again a bench warmer. I, I needed to sort of find a, uh, what I was going to do. During that period of time, we also uh, were blessed to, to get a new pastor. And for Asbury, it was a historic change in leadership because it was our first female senior minister, uh, Iantha Mills, who's a very fine preacher. She sought me out. Uh, I don't know why. I don't know how. Uh, just sought me out, wanted to talk to me about some of my impressions because I had just come back. And so I, I didn't know the minister before. I'd met him, Dr. Shockley. I'd talked with him. But I had missed, you know, a, a decade of experience at Asbury. And it had changed from when I left, what it, what it was. And she wanted to engage me on how I might get more involved. And I, 
I said, I really don't know, and I'm traveling a lot. And I, she kept on, and she convinced me to consider uh, becoming the lay leader. I had to look up what the lay leader did. I, I, I knew who some of them were, but I didn't, you know. What do they do? Uh, well, they, they are supposed to be uh, of a good uh, pipeline to, uh, to, to translate for the clergy the pulse of the, la the laity, what lay people of the church. People come up and say to lay leader sometimes things they would never say to the preacher. It was important to say that to the preacher or to say that to some of the other committees of, uh, other committees of the church. So that, I kept that, that post for four years, uh, ably aided by Daryl Wiles uh, in the post. And, and I, I enjoyed that, that part of my service at Asbury to, become, to get to know more people at Asbury and to get to know what they thought about things. And I stepped down because I, I did it for four years and I thought that was long enough. We needed a new uh, set of leaders, new kinds of leadership, which we got in Daryl and Sandy. Uh, and that's worked remarkably well. I set out for another year and then I got recruited again to, to chair the church council. And I now chair the church council, which is the, the administrative organ of the church that sort of brings together all of its uh, administrative and area ministries uh, to kind of help direct, the, direct the, uh, the movement of the church, the strategy and the direction that we move as a congregation. Do you have any secrets that you want to share about how we're moving as a congregation? No, not one. <laughs> <laughs> no a, secrets. It's a big deal. I mean, a church is, a, is an entity um, that it takes a lot to keep it going and, and make it going. And you've yes. talked about how it's a, it's a thing that, especially at Asbury, it sort of drew you in and kept you in its trajectory yes. and part of its, of its bosom, if you will. What changes um, are you hoping to see in Asbury? But what do you hope you never lose from Asbury? Well, one of the things the church is blessed with is a lot of members who care a lot about uh, what's going on at the church and, and what its ministries are and how we need to be reaching out. Uh, the one thing I hope we never lose is people who love Asbury. There are people who grew up in Asbury. I was married to a woman who grew up in Asbury, her family, all in Asbury. Uh, I love Asbury. Uh, it was a place of rescue for me. Not that I was lost, but I was looking for a place to worship. And I found Asbury, and I'm very glad I did. And I love that church. I love what role it has had in this community, what it has stood for in this community what we continue to want to stand for in this community. I love the fact that we are embracing change. I love the fact that we are struggling like, uh, like some other churches are not struggling, but we're struggling to know what our new identity is going to be. There are churches that these changes are coming and they're not undertaking the exercises that we are. I love the fact that we still find it important to serve in the Washington DC community and that people are fierce about staying on that corner to serve D.C. That's what I love about Asbury and I hope it never changes. Native Washingtonians, I, I would be remiss in not talking about that as, mm -hmm. as we go. So you, when you came here, what, you had been to Washington before, but as we think about Asbury and what Asbury has meant, as you said, um, what were your impressions when you first got here of Asbury as a non-native Washingtonian? And <laughs> well, uh, I will say this. It, it was probably, people, I think people have a, a, a mixed view of Asbury. Some people kind of think it's an elite church, elite black church, uh, kind of highfalutin and all of that. I actually think that's the, that may be the very old Asbury. Uh, you didn't feel that way? I did not feel that way. Uh, I, I will say I, I did not. I absolutely did not feel it. Now, it was a church that had different kinds of music. And sometimes people want one kind of music. It sang anthems. It did spirituals. It did gospel. 
Uh, it did classical concerts. I actually think that's a gift uh, because African Americans are represented in all of that genre. Uh, steel band uh, at Asbury I've enjoyed. I mean, I, I, I think, I think it's, it's a friendly church. I think people uh, are thinking of the old Asbury when they think that. I think I've had many people come and visit, white and black, who said they had never felt as welcome at a church as they, they had at Asbury. And are there people who um, don't think that, that there should be that diversity of music? Have you experienced that also? Yes, some. Some. I mean, you, you get a lot of, people have a lot of opinions about how a church ought to conduct its services, and that's a good thing. But the one thing we all have to be is intentional about how we worship. And, and we can worship in a variety of ways, but whatever those ways we choose, we ought to be intentional about it. We talk about intentional worship and always putting Christ first. What are some of the more kookier, more innovative ideas that you've had for bringing uh, Asbury, for example, into this new age in which we live? Well, I think we are, we are talking about and trying to identify new ways to worship. Uh, one, I think we should probably do more outdoor worship, not just inside that very beautiful chapel uh, that's at that corner of 11th and K. We have a couple of parks nearby. I know uh, friends of mine at the church thinks we ought to be doing that, and I actually think that's a good idea. I think uh, we, from time to time, our choirs go out on the steps and they'll sing before worship starts. That's a great idea because it, it shows the activity uh, going on at the church and the quality of the music at our church. I actually think we should be putting together a community choir uh, bringing members of the community into uh, Asbury to sing with us. Uh, that will also bring people, their friends, to come hear them sing. Uh, I think we should be identifying soloists from communities to come and participate with us. Uh, just all kinds of things we could be doing. I think, you know, if we could afford it, we should, we should uh, probably have the church open during the week and provide tours. Uh, so people can see the stained glass windows to talk about the history of the church because it's a very rich history. And people are always passing by looking at it and the doors are closed. Uh, one of the things I always loved about when I went to Europe is all of the big cathedrals. You could go in at any time of the day and there were always people there and they were walking around and they also collected money. Uh, uh, but I just think we, there are a lot more things we can do to extend ourselves to the community and we hope that the community will also embrace us. Nasbury is one of the historical sites of the district. I mean, we are a proclaimed site. Yes, it's on the register of, of historic places for the district and the National Registry of Historic Places. And I've heard mention of the Underground Railroad activity that, particular, that potentially took place in that church. Yeah, I'm, I don't know whether we were a site uh, on the Underground Railroad or whether a number of our members helped people who were traversing the Underground Railroad. But it's certainly on the Underground Railroad trail uh, as a historic site in the district. Well, as you would think of a group of black people that were able to end up at 11th and K, K yes. at that time and to still proudly be there today. It's a marvelous legacy. This is quite an accomplishment. Yes. I want to thank you for your accomplishments. I want to thank you for sharing with us today. I want to thank you really for your service, the things that you have done throughout all of these sectors uh, in which you have served for what you have done in Asbury and for what you have done as a man. I thank you very much, Robert Millett. Mallet. Mallet. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and I look forward to speaking with you again. Well, you're kind to thank me, but I really, I, I am the grateful one. I have been given the gifts. Is there anything I haven't asked you about today that you do want to bring forward before we stop? There probably is, but I can't think of what it is. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much.